testing. I'm going to wait a few more minutes because nobody else is here. I'm actually going to wander into the lobby for a minute. I'll be back.
You are the only person in the class. Yup. Yup. They might, I don't know. Usually there's only a couple of people who routinely show up in person and the uh, online tends to trickle in, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Aha, hello second person. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, might as well get started, I guess. It is being recorded, so maybe people will check it out online when I, you know, get around to uploading it, which I am really awful about, not gonna lie. Um, okay. So today, as usual, we're gonna review some of the last class, and then we're gonna go over um, some more stuff in terms of graphing lines. There's graphing with slope and intercept, which is very, very useful. Um, and there's there's not a whole lot you can you can mess up. So it's honestly it's my preferred way of graphing, at least straight lines. Uh, then we have a method of finding equations of lines given pieces of them. Um, then we have how to graph inequalities, and I'm not sure that we're going to get to units of measurement. Um, this particular class has, I mean, tonight and next week, and that's left. No, that's all that's left. And I separated out all the uh, all the subjects between the two classes that we're doing this fall, uh, so that I literally have what I'm covering tonight and measurement and like bar graphs and stuff. And that's that's it. So I might actually might actually cut tonight short before we hit the units of measurement stuff, just so we we do in fact have some stuff for next week as well. Um so let's jump in. As usual, I like to cover what we did last time. Not a whole lot of difference between these slides and last time's slides. Um, still the idea of graphing on the Cartesian plane is if you're given a point, um, it's considered an ordered pair, which is in the format X comma Y in a set of parentheses. Um, what you end up doing is you always move left or right along the X axis first as you need to. And then from that particular spot, uh, you move up or down according to that Y coordinate. You draw your dot, put a label next to it saying which point it is, and you are good. So graphing by plotting points. Um, Exactly, exactly the same slides as last time. Didn't didn't make new stuff. Nothing's changed. The idea is that if you're given an equation and you need to graph the equation just by plotting some points, you pick some. You can either pick some x's or some y's or a mix of the two. It doesn't actually matter. Um, conventionally, we tend to plug in random things for x's. It makes makes things a little bit more straightforward. Um, particularly if you have a formula that starts with y equals, that's just just going to make your life easier to plug in for x at that point. Um, in fact, until you really get a good hold on them, I would say for all of them, I would solve them for y equals and plug things in for x. That is just just good good habit to be in. 
So you take those X values and you plug them into the equation, each one individually, of course, you plug them into the equation and you get a Y equals. For instance, this slide is telling us that when X is negative two, when you work it out a little bit, you end up with Y is negative three. So you do that the other couple of times, you plug in a zero, you'd have two times nothing plus one. So you would just end up with a one. So that's why we have zero one for the next one. And the one after that, we have uh, X being two, you would plug in the two to that thing. You have two times two is four plus one is five. So that's where those points come from. Then you graph those on your plane. So negative two, negative three, you go to the left two and down three. Zero, one, you don't go left or right anywhere because the movement in the X is zero, uh, but you do go up one to zero, one. And then two, five, you move to the right two and then up five. You draw those three points, you say, yay, I got points. Uh, are they along a straight line? If they are, then you've not made a mistake, most likely. Uh, and you can just go ahead and draw a line between those points. And again, like I said last time, if you're graphing things by plotting points, you generally want to do um, three points. You could get away with two points as long as you're 100% sure that you're not making any mistakes. Um, having that third point is just there to kind of make a check because any two points you do, even if they're wrong, end up being wrong, um, that's going to make a line. But if you do a third point and two of your answers were right and one of them was wrong or the other way around, two of them were wrong and one of them was right, they're not going to line up. So you generally do a third point to make sure that you're not making just a simple mistake. It doesn't take a lot more time. You can just throw it together. Okay, so we got a lot of examples. A um, couple of these examples have some new concepts in them that I didn't cover last time, uh, particularly the last two. Um, but for now, just going to start with the first guy, y equals 4x. This one's already solved like I like it. I like having the y equals. That makes my life easier. Okay. Am I getting a phone call? What was that? I am not getting a phone call. I'm just having random leg spasms. That's cool. All right. So we have y equals 4x. All right. Not too bad looking, right? So we're just going to make a little x, y chart. And we could plug in whatever values that we want. We could plug in for y. We could plug in for x. As long as I have y equals, I always think it's easier to plug in for x. So I usually like to do things really close to the origin. If you remember, the origin is the point zero, 0 on the graph. If I put plug in x values that are smaller, uh, generally, the y values that output end up small as well, and that makes my graph look a little bit neater and keeps it kind of small. I don't want to. I don't want to have to go out to to graph twenty or something like that. I just like the smaller numbers. So, like I've said, I usually end up doing something like negative one, zero, and one. I might do zero, one, two. I might. You know, depending on the problem, if I think those points are too close together, I might do zero, two, four, something like that. At the very least, I usually have a zero hanging out because it's on the axis and it's really good to have the points where they cross the axis. It kind of makes your life a little bit, little bit simpler in terms of graphing. Um, because if I put a bunch of points off to the side and my axis is over here and I kind of eyeball drawing a the line, then it doesn't cross the axis at the right place and it's kind of a mess, right? You could easily say, hey, that's not the right graph. So I usually just plug in a zero. 
and I don't even care. Let's do a one, let's do a two. So we have y equals four times each of these. So four times nothing is nothing. We don't necessarily need to write it out. Um, if you have, a, if you're say doing this on a homework assignment and they say, show your work, then yeah, absolutely. But for a problem like this, we have four times the X. I can easily say, hey, four times that. Hey, four times that. Cool, we got our points, right? So we draw our graph. Notice I'm not doing a whole lot of negatives. That's because everything I have over here is positive. My Y values go up to eight. My X values only go out to two, two, three, just for good measure, but that's really all I need, right? I don't need anything over here. I don't need anything further over there. And we plug in the points we got. So our points that we have are zero, zero, right there. That's the origin. Then the next point we have is one, four. So that's one in the direction of X and four in the direction of Y. A little higher, whatever. It just looks big now. One, four. And then we have two, eight. Two and eight right up here. You look at it and say, do those look like they're along a straight line? Yeah, yeah, they do, right? Okay, well, if they look like they're along a straight line, you just draw a line between them and we call it good. That's it. Yeah, there we go. Not too bad, right? Now, the next one is y equals one third x minus four. And I made sure to have one with a fraction in here because my zero, one, and two aren't gonna work out too nicely. Zero is still gonna work out nicely, don't get me wrong. Because one third of zero is zero, and zero minus four is minus four. So if I plug in the zero, this this thing just goes away, and that's what I have left. The other ones, well, not quite as easy, right? So let's find some things to plug in. But everything I plug in for x, I know I'm going to have one third multiplied onto it, right? So if I have one third multiplied onto that. Well, what do what do I want to plug in? I don't want to plug in one, two, seven. You know, I I don't want to have a fraction that I have to then subtract four from and then try to put on a graph. Doesn't sound fun. I know I go gung ho on fractions all the time. That is that that is a battle that we are not picking. So what you generally want to do is you want to look at your fraction and say, okay, my denominator is three. So if I got one third times X, if I plug in things that are divisible by that three, then it'll go in evenly and I won't have fractions, right? So I could do maybe a three. I could do maybe a negative three. That's kind of cheap, but it works. It's kind of like my one zero negative one thing, except in this case, we have threes instead. So let's plug that in and see what we get. We have Y equals one third of x, which in this case is 3, minus 4. One third of 3 is 1 minus 4. So we get a negative 3. Okay. Then we're going to do the exact same thing with that negative 3 that we have here. One third of negative three is a negative one, still minus four. So we end up with a negative five. Okay. 
Well, not too bad, right? Not too bad. My Y values all, all are kind of low. My X values go from negative three to three. So it's, it's gonna be a pretty, pretty quick graph. I'm gonna not have a whole lot of room in my, uh, my Y direction. Just because, well, we don't have any positive Y values, right? We just have negatives. So as long as I go down to five here, we're good. I just need three in this direction and negative three in this direction. Okay, so let's plot some points. First one up, zero, negative four. So the X coordinate zero, so it's staying on the axis. Then we're going down one, two, three, four, right there. So that's zero, negative four. Now let's do this guy. This one's three, negative three. So we go over three on the X and then down three here. So that is three, negative three. And then our next one is negative three, negative five. So I'm gonna go three back and then five down. There we go. Just draw a line between them like we usually do. So they're not bad, right? We're just plugging something in for one of our variables, getting the other one, and taking that point where we have an X and a Y and putting it on our graph. And as long as they're in a straight line, draw a line between them. That line is going to encompass every single possible solution to this question, even the fractional ones. Anything that makes this true is on that line. There we go. What else we got? I have 5x minus y is equal to 5. 5x minus y is equal to 5. Now, this is the first one where we're looking at it today and it doesn't have y equals, right? So you could do a couple of things. Um, we could plug things in for y and solve for x or vice versa, plug things in for X, solve for Y. Um, if I want to solve this guy like these ones, um, I would have to do the solve for Y thing and then plug in just X's. Um, let's say, okay. So let's say we're probably gonna just solve this guy for y. That's honestly like, if you just keep that as a rule of thumb, then it's never gonna steer you wrong. So if I tried to get the y alone on this formula, I would have to get rid of this piece. So I'm gonna subtract the five x on both sides. Okay. So we get a negative y is left over here, and that's equal to a negative five x plus five. Remember, we're putting this one here because one, it kind of looks like that formula that we had um, that we're going to be using more today. And two, uh, you generally want these things in descending order of powers. So since this guy has an X and this one doesn't, generally you would put the X first. If I had something with an X squared, it would go in front here. So basically the highest power first, and then you work your way down. Now, we wanted y equals, but we have a negative y equals. So I got to get rid of that negative. What you're going to do is you're going to divide everything by a negative one. And given the nature of a negative one, you could also multiply each thing by a negative one. That's fine too. Doesn't actually matter at all. All right, well, what does that do? Negative divided by a negative is a positive. Negative divided by a negative is a positive. 
positive divided by a negative is a negative. Well, cool. 5x minus 5. That sounds nice. I like it. It's going to work fine. So I definitely want to keep my x values small. Because if you look at this, what are we doing to the x? We're multiplying it by 5. And if I'm going to multiply that thing by 5, well, I don't want to plug in a 5 here, because then I'm going to be having a big graph. I want a small graph. So we're going to do uh, I'm going to do my usual, negative 1, 0, and 1. We don't have a fraction here, so it should work out fine, right? So for each of these, we're going to need to solve it. So we have 5 times negative 1 minus 5. 5 times nothing minus 5. And 5 times positive 1 minus 5. So what do we got? Well, this ends up being a negative 5 right here, right? We multiply the 5 by the negative 1. We get a negative 5 minus 5. Got a minus 10. OK. And over here, we have 5 times nothing minus 5. Well, 5 times nothing is nothing. Minus 5 is minus 5. And then 5 times 1 minus 5. Well, 5 minus 5 is 0. So those are our points. Now, one thing that's interesting to notice, I have a 0 point for my x and a 0 point for my y. So one thing you could actually do, and that's actually, that's another method they like to, to teach in some of these books, um, is graphing by intercepts. Because if this guy has the point 0, negative 5, if we have that point, that's telling us that this guy isn't going left or right on the x at all, right? It's just going up or down. So that's actually our y-intercept. And then the other one where it moves in the x, but it doesn't move in the y, so it's guaranteed to be stuck on that axis. We also have the point 1, 0, and that's called our x-intercept. So one method of graphing these actually has us just putting in a 0 for x, putting in a 0 for y, figuring out what those are, and then graphing them. Now, the downside of this method is that it doesn't give you the option for a check. So usually, you could still do a third point. Um, but I'll show you why it works out so nicely here. So I'm going to need a negative 10, 4, 5. I'm going to be cheap about it and do my next 5 when I have to, have to graph it. It's kind of cheap, but it works. So I'm going to graph these two first. We have the point 0, negative 5. That's our y-intercept. 0, not moving left or right. Negative 5 right here. Then we have the point one zero, and that's our x-intercept. So one and then zero. And you can kind of see right now that just based on those two points, you could just get a nice line. And we are knowing exactly where it crosses these axes. And if we know that, then our graph, it looks a lot more accurate. Now. In our case, we do want that third point as a check, that negative 1, negative 10. So negative 1, negative 10. And we can draw our line. But yes, in the future, if you are plotting points and you're like, oh, God, I'm confused, 
one way you can do it is plug in a zero for X, plug in a zero for Y, and just get your intercepts. You don't necessarily need to remember which one's which because they're just points. And if I said, hey, is this the x-intercept or the y-intercept? It really boils down to which of these axes is it intercepting? Which one is it crossing through? The x or the y? Well, the y, right? That's our y-axis. This one's crossing through the x-axis, so that's an x-intercept. That's all that means. Okay. So we have two more of these examples, and these are largely just to show you something new. So for number four, we have x equals five. And for number five, we have y equals two. Given the unique nature of these guys, I'm gonna kind of do them both at once, right? So you can see what's happening with an x equals to y equals. Well. Let's say, let's say I was still going to be doing some graphing points, right? Let's say I was going to do that. Well, we already have our X's. We just, we're just going to need to know what our Y are, right? So let's, let's plug in some Y's. We're going to plug in some Y's because we're given X. And then for each of those, we would say, well, what is X? X is five. Okay, when this is zero, X is five. X is always five. X is five everywhere. Put negative a billion, we'd have a five right here. So what does that graph look like? Well, all of these have different Y values but the same X value. So if I graph them, there's one, there's one, and there's one, you can see this is just a straight up and down line. So every time you have X equals, this is going to be a vertical line. And based on that, you can guess what's going to happen with y equals 2. Because in this case, it doesn't matter what I plug in for x. What's y? 2. It's 2 everywhere, right? So if we have y equals 2, doesn't matter what the x value is because we know what our y value is. It's two here, it's two here, it's two here, it's two everywhere. So we just end up with a horizontal line. Anytime you have y equal to a number, because it's constant. Doesn't matter what the other variable would have been, y is always two. Okay. Any questions on plotting points? Then let's move on. Now that wasn't all we did last time, right? We also played around with the slope. So the slope is effectively kind of the, the angle of our line, right? It's kind, of, it's kind of its direction. So you generally find it with this formula right here. And you would have two points, x1 and y1, and another one, x2 and y2, right? So we have point one and point two. All you have to do is find the change in the y values 
between the two points and the change in the x values between the two points. As long as you set those up as a fraction, that's your slope. Um, another nice way of looking at this that we're going to be using very quickly in uh, five slides. Um, you want to think of it as rise over run because a change in the y's is a change in the rise um, and a change in the x's is a change in the run. So it's a good way to keep it in your head. Now, this is the formula that we're generally going to be using for the next, well, the rest of this class. Y equals MX plus B. Now, it's called the slope intercept form because mathematicians have no imagination. It's literally called slope intercept because there's a slope and there's an intercept in it. That's it. So, where are they? Well, Based on the last slide, we know that M is usually used as a stand-in for the slope. So Y equals MX means that whatever is attached to the X is gonna be our slope. And then we have plus B. The B actually ends up being our uh, Y intercept, right? Or at the very least, the Y value of our Y intercept, right? because the x value would always be zero. So based on this formula and based on the previous formula, we have a bunch of problems. You know me, you know I like problems. You know I like making problems that seem like actual problems. So let's work some out. All right, so we know that each of these are in the form x, y, right? So if our formula looks like so, it might be a good idea to label some of these points. Say that's point one, that's point two. And now we have our variables in the exact same setup as our formula. Now, even if you didn't get that, we would still know that it ends up being the difference in the y's on top. So if I, start, I can start from here, take this and subtract that, and then the difference on the x's on the bottom. Well, there's the one we started from was this point. So we have to start from the same point on the bottom. Subtract that guy. Okay. Not bad, not bad. Subtracting a negative turns into a plus. So we have four minus three, one, over 20 plus 15, 35. Not the prettiest slope in the world, but that's our slope. That's all you gotta do. Find the difference in the y's, Put it over the difference in the x's. So the next one is asking, but not for the slope between one one and five hundred five hundred. This one I mainly wrote down here to demonstrate that it doesn't matter which points you pick on a line to find the slope. As long as they're on the slope, this, uh, or on the line, the slope is going to be the same between any two points on that line. So it doesn't matter if they're all really close to the origin or they're all really far from the origin or you have one of each. Either way, all you're going to do is do the difference in the y's. So let's say we start with this one. And we subtract that. 
over the difference in the x's. Well, same thing happens, right? So 500 minus one on top and bottom. So we end up with 499 over 499. Well, what does that break down to? You don't have to factor 499 if you have it over itself, it just turns into a one. And that's actually the case because if I looked at this and I said, okay, well, what's one as a fraction? Well, it'd be one out of one, right? One over one. So on our slope, we would have the rise being one and the run being one. So from each point, like this guy, it would go up one and over one. And you'd have your next point, which would be two, two. From two, two, you go up and over to three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, et cetera. And it'll go on forever, go on forever. It actually makes a perfect diagonal line. These points would fall on the graph y equals x, which makes sense, right? The y is the same as the x. Y is the same as x. So guess what our formula is, y equals x. Next one, I have some random points here. We have 12 and negative 34, as well as 56 and negative 78. Yeah. So we're going to do the same thing, right? We're going to do y minus y. So negative 78 minus a negative 34 over x minus x, 56 minus 12. Now in this case, again, we're subtracting a negative, so it turns into a positive. So we have negative 78 plus 34. That's negative 44. And then we have 56 minus 12. That's positive 44. Well, negative 44 divided by a positive 44, negative one. All right, not bad. So interestingly enough, this, would be kind of like this last one, but it wouldn't go through the origin. Because if everything's going over one unit at a time and there's like 20 points between these guys, then this graph is like off, offset like 20, 20 values. We are not gonna play that game. Don't wanna play that game. We're good. Okay. Let's do more. I know you guys love math, so we might as well do a lot more, right? So four, I have a formula. Eight X minus two Y is four. Okay. If you hear anything loud, they're vacuuming in the hallway. Okay, so we're still on find the slope, right? So how do I find the slope based on a graph or an equation? Well, all we have to do is get this in that formula, y equals mx plus b. Because if we have it in that formula, well, then we're just going to need to know what the what the m is, right? Let's close the window here. So I'm going to rewrite it below that just so I have like a clear line of my steps here. 
So we have this and we decided that we're gonna try to get it in this formula, right? So all we have to do is get Y alone. If we get Y alone, the rest of it's just gonna fall into place. So I'm gonna subtract the eight X from both sides because the first thing we wanna do is get the term with the Y alone. So we have a negative two Y left on this side. Over here, well, we have a negative eight X and then plus the four that was already there, right? Okay. Well, all we need to get Y alone is to get rid of this negative two. So I'm gonna divide off the negative two on every individual term. And then we're gonna clean it up. That cancels off perfectly, so we just have a Y. Over here, we have a negative divided by a negative, which is positive. Eight divided by two is four, so we have four X. And over here, we have a positive divided by a negative, which is a negative. And then four divided by two is two. So we have Y equals four X minus two, which now fits our formula perfectly, right? We can identify the M and we can identify the B. Y equals four, which is our M, X, plus b. Well, our b in this case would be a negative two. Not worried about that yet. Comes in real handy for graphing, but all we really care about right now is that slope. Our m is four. Okay. So number five, x equals six y, right? All right, a little funkier, a little stranger, right? But again, even though it's it looks like there's not a whole lot you could do, we could still get it in this formula by solving for the y equals. So all I gotta do is divide off the six, Oh, well, then I have X over six is equal to Y, right? Not quite what we are looking for. So let's look at potentially cleaning it up. Um, so first of all, we could flip this around. You can absolutely get away with that. And then another property of these is if you have something on top, that's it's gonna be the same if you pull that out front. Um, so what I mean is you can actually rewrite this as being one sixth of X, right? Because X divided by six is the same as one sixth of X. Well, now it looks a lot closer to that formula. We have a thing attached to the X. No, we don't have anything over here. We don't have some number telling us what our Y, uh, y intercept is. So if I don't have a number there, I guess what our y-intercept is? Zero. In this case, it would have been zero. So our slope is just that one-sixth. Yeah. Let's do more. We have two more, we have y equals six and x equals one. So we have to identify the slopes in these guys. Well, we don't have one, right? We don't have one. We can't, neither one of these, you can get into the formula y equals mx plus b. So we're going to have to think about it. We're going to have to think about it. So what I'm going to do real quick is sketch a quick graph of y equals 6. And at the same time, I'm just going to go ahead and, and sketch a graph of x equals 1.
not the prettiest graphs I've ever done, I know, but they get the point across, right? So we're trying to identify slope. It's change in y's over the change in x's. There's a couple of things you can do. You could take the really long route, and after graphing these, you could pick some points on the graph, and we could plug them into the slope formula, right? But there's an easier way. The easier way is thinking of slope. Oops. Thinking of slope as rise over run. And we can kind of we can kind of eyeball that, right? Now, in the case of y equals six, for our slope here, do we have just pick two points on the graph and kind of eyeball them. Between any two points, is there a rise between them? No, right? It's a flat line. It's a perfectly horizontal line. There is no rise. But is there a run? Yeah, it's going forever to either side, right? Um, we can't say between two points there's only one unit. Uh, because between those two points, there's an infinite amount of decimals in between them. So I kind of, I usually just, I know it's a terrible thing, but I usually like squiggly line for like something. So between any two points, the rise is zero, but the run is something. Between, uh, between zero and one, it's one. Between zero and two, it's two. I mean, it just depends on which points you look at, right? Well, what's zero out of anything? Zero, right? Zero out of five? Zero out of 100? It all breaks down to zero. So on problems like these, we have zero slope. Sometimes this is also referred to as no slope. Now, as you can imagine, with a line that's going the complete opposite direction, right? 90 degrees off of there, it is a vertical line. If I was doing rise over run between any two points, well, in terms of the run, X is always one. So at no point is this ever going to go around, right? It's not going to wiggle to the left. It's not going to wiggle to the right. And then is there a rise? Yeah, nothing but. Between any two points, it's whatever their distance is, is the rise. So again, it's just kind of like uh, something's here, right? There's some, some squiggly thing that exists, right? So we have the exact opposite scenario. Exact opposite scenario. Well, what happens if I divide something by zero? Well, nothing happens. You can't do that. You can't say I have something out of nothing. Right? So in cases like this, it, there is a difference. It's not that our value is zero. It's that it can't exist. So what you end up doing is saying that the slope is undefined or it does not exist or just the word undefined. It doesn't exist. There isn't one, not even the number zero because that implies I have zero. This one's so much not, not existing that we can't even say it's not them. Okay. So do we have any questions on this stuff? Does everything make sense? Anybody horrified? No flailing so far. It's a good sign. Yeah. Well, for now, let's move on. So this class is going to be largely about using the slope intercept. 
So the slope intercept form of a line of an equation is, in my opinion, it's the most useful because it allows us to get all the necessary information in order to graph the line just by looking. So again, we consider the slope as rise over run. And what you end up doing is you say, oh, okay, well, based on the slope, any two points on that line are that much rise above that point and that much run from that point. Any two lines are that distance apart, or any two points, I mean. Well, as I wrote there, with the slope written as a fraction, each point is rise in the y direction and run in the x direction from each previous point. The b value in the formula gives you your starting point. That's your y-intercept. So you always start from the y-intercept, and then you go rise, run, rise, run, rise, run. So you use that as a starting point, and you find more points on your graph. And it's so quick that it really just depends on you how many points you do. You could do two points. Um, usually, I do a bunch of them just because I am, as you can tell, I'm awful about gra drawing graphs. If I make a bunch of points, then my line is going to be that much more accurate. Okay. So just like we've already done, you would actually want your equations to all be in slope intercept form before you start doing this. So again, we just solve them all for y equals. So you do whatever you gotta do to get the y alone on one side, get the x starting first on the other side, and then you have your number being added to it or subtracted from it. Now this particular example, has fractions galore. And I'm going to tell you right now, I hate the idea of graphing. Now, just for funsies, let's see what it looks like. Looks like that. Okay. So that means that, ah, look at this. We can see that our graph See, there's an annotate. I don't know if anybody can see my point, my mouse cursor, unless I have the stop, uh, the spotlight on. So if you see this, this is the range from zero to two. So that means that one is right smack dab in the middle. Well, our y-intercept was four thirds. Ugh, right? We have to go to that one and then go up another third of the way to two. I don't like it. I don't like it, I don't want it. Now, you also get the fact that every single point is negative two away from it. So down to uh, about there, and about there, and then over three. One, two, three. So that's giving you a couple of points on your graph and you would just draw a line between them, All right? So let's play with this. Let's play with this. Number one is 2x plus y is equal to 2. And we're going to be graphing this guy without plotting any points at all, right? I mean, we're going to be plotting points, but we're not going to make a chart out of it. We're not going to have to put in that much effort. All we're really going to have to do is get this in our standard formula of slope intercept. Form. So we're going to subtract the 2x over. We get y is equal to negative 2x plus 2 
And at least until you understand what you're doing, I would always write out my slope and my y-intercept. Because my slope is what's on the x, right? So it's negative two. And my y-intercept is just going to be that other piece, the two. Now, you might remember when I pulled up the formula, formula for this, and I said that the y-intercept is technically a point that would look like that. Some people get really anal about having that written exactly that way. I'm not one of them. I was not taught by any of them, so I don't care. But if you keep going with math, that is something you could potentially run into. I don't think it'll ever be a problem, but that's what we got. It also might help you understand it a little better if you write it that way too. <clears throat> okay. So all we're really gonna do is we're gonna start off with our graph. And in this case, you don't really know where your points are, right? We know our y-intercept is two. So that means that there's a point right there. Right away, I know that means that. Problem is finding the other points, right? All right, well, we have to use our slope from this point, that negative two. Well, that's a problem. We normally think of it as rise over run. And in this case, I just have a negative two. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put that over a one. If you just have an integer, you're just gonna put it over a one. That way you can see it as rise over run. So between every two points on this graph, there is a, a ratio of negative two difference in height to one run in width. So what do we do with this information? Easy. What we're going to do is start, uh, put your pen on that spot on the y-intercept and we're gonna say, okay, this is where we're starting. Our rise is negative two, which means we're gonna go down two and our run is one over one. Once you've done that, draw a dot. Okay, there's two points on my graph. I could keep going. My rise is negative two, my run is one. So each one of these, I'm gonna go down two and over one. Down two, over one. Down two, over one. And you could keep going. You could even remember that this guy would be equal to this guy, because as long as I have one negative in here, these are gonna clean up the same. So that negative can kind of travel. So you could also think of this as going up to and back one. You can go the opposite direction. Up to back one. How many points did I just find? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I found seven points. That would have taken us a while to find, right? If we plug them in and work them out and put them in a little chart. But we just found seven points on this graph. Here's my hideous line between them. But that's what you gotta do. You don't have to necessarily put all of those points, but I just wanted to show you guys how quick you can get away with doing that, right? So the second one, we have y is equal to three x minus two. And that's great right? Because it's already in our formula. Our m is 3 
and our y-intercept is a negative two. So it's just, there's a slope, there's the y-intercept. Our m, I'm still gonna think of that as being over one, right? Because that's gonna make our rise over run happen. Okay. All right, cool. Well, let's see. Let's graph this guy. So every time you do one of these problems, you start from the y-intercept. Our y-intercept is negative two. There it is right there. There's our first point on the graph. Our slope is three. So it rises three and runs one. So again, pen on the spot, go up three over one. There's the spot. You could draw a line between these now. If you're worried about it being perfectly straight or anything, you can go up three again and over one as many times as you need to. Doesn't matter. You could do it once, you could do it twice, you could do it six more times, doesn't matter. As long as you have enough to draw a nice smooth line between them, you are good. Not too bad, right? So the next one is y equals 2x minus 3. So almost the same formula, right? Just the numbers are flipped around a little bit. What's that going to do for us? Let's find out. So again, there's our slope. There's our y-intercept. So I'm going to draw my graph. You could even be cheap about it. This is 100%. I'm going to do this one like I would do on my own homework, which, again, is to say that if you have a teacher who's very particular about how you graph, you don't want to follow my lead. But I could just go off of the things I know, right? The y-intercept is negative 3. There's the point I got. My next point was going to be rise two and run one. So I'm going to go up two, and then I have to go over one. There's another point. From here, I could go up two and then over one. There's a point. And I didn't even have to draw out a full graph, right? Now, you probably don't want it to look quite as sloppy as I just pulled from my magical hat here. But you can absolutely get away with doing that. And that's actually one that I do that that way myself, purely because it kind of meshes really well with the way that I was drawing the graphs before when I would look at my my plots, and I would say I only need to go out this far to the left, this far to the right, etc. So if I do it this way, I'm kind of building it as I go. So it's never going to go in a direction that I'm worried about. Got a couple more for number four we have y is equal to negative one half x plus two. Aha, our first fraction. First fractional slope. And you'll actually find these are easier to graph than just having that number. Because if, if I do this number, I just have to remember that it's over one. Not a lot of work, I know. 
but I can see my rise and I can see my run. Ah, but the negative's outside, so where does it go? So I always, I always recommend picking where that negative is. Now, one thing you might notice, one thing you might notice is that when you have a negative slope, it's going down. If I have a positive slope, they're going up. So I can already tell just based on this being a negative, it's gonna go down, right? It's gonna go down a little bit more gradually because our rise is one, but our run is two. It's moving over faster than it's moving down. So what I'm going to do is when I, I look at something like this, I usually take that negative and I put it on either top or bottom, like so. That way I can clearly see to myself that I have a rise over a run and I know which one I'm using the negative for. The y-intercept, no biggie, same thing, right? Okay, so where's our graph? Our y-intercept is two. Okay, so our slope is negative one over two. So from our point, we're gonna go down one and over two. Draw our dot. Down one, over two. Down one, over two. There we go, we got four points, just like that. No problem at all. And we're good. It's sloping down because we have a negative uh, negative uh, slope. Okay. I believe we have one more of these. I was hoping to fit them all on one page, but such is life. So I have three x plus six y is eighteen. So again, we're going to solve this for y. Oh, and this is okay. So we're going to solve it for y. So we get the term with y alone. So we're going to subtract the 3x. So we're going to have 6y is equal to negative 3x plus 18. We'll divide off the six everywhere. This cancels. This will reduce, right? We'll have negative one half X. And then this will reduce to a three. Now you might notice this is almost exactly the last line, right? Almost exactly. So things we know, we know that it's that if the slope is the same, it's going to be going down at that same gradual level, right? It's going to have that exact shape to it as the last one. However, we have a different y-intercept. So in this case, we would start up here at three, and then we would follow the exact same setup. We would be going down one over two, down one over two, down one over two, and draw our line between. In this case, it went through one, two, three, four, five. It went through the point um, six, zero. 
Whereas if you look at our last one, same shape, but this one went through four zero. So that plus two versus that plus three shifted it over twice because we went up one. So the difference in the width is gonna be two because that's our slope. That also means since they have the same slope, they would be parallel lines. They would run alongside of each other forever and never cross. It's like a Nicholas Sparks novel or something, right? I'm sorry to anyone who reads Nicholas Sparks novels because they're garbage. I regret nothing. The guy writes random love stories and then decides, uh, cancer, car crash, disease. Just lazy writing. Okay. Are we feeling good about using slope intercept form? Does anyone have any questions, any concerns about it? Or are we feeling nice? We're feeling good about it. Everything is wonderful. I feel like that's the way we're gonna go. All right, so let's move on to some more stuff. Finding an equation of a line. So sometimes you're only given partial information about a line and you have to find an equation or otherwise uh, use that equation for another purpose. So you might, you might be looking for something a little bit tougher, but you really need that equation to get where you gotta be, right? Um, so this is gonna be how you'd find that equation. So say you're given a slope of negative four and have to, uh, and a point, uh, negative one, negative six, and you have to find an equation, right? Well, look at that slope intercept form is there are two methods of doing this. I decided for this class, I was gonna show um, the more accepted method, but I have seen teachers do what's on this slide. Um, so if you look at that formula, there are four variables, right? Y, M, X, and B. But look at what we're given. We're given a slope, which is an M, and we're given a point, which is an X and a Y. So we have X, y and m the only one we'd be missing is b right so you could actually plug those three numbers into that formula and solve it for b and if you solve it for b you have an m and you have a b and you can make your make your formula right this is our formula all it needs is the m and the b so you just sub them in now there's also a specific equation you use for these. It looks like that. Now, do not fear this thing. So I'm sure a couple, a couple of people probably just went like, ah, oh, I hate that. But think back on our formula for the slope. Our slope was y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And it was equal to m, right? Look at this formula. If I divided that set of parentheses over to the other side, I would have y minus y1 over x minus x1 equals m. This is the slope formula, just moved around a little bit. So if you understand finding a slope, you're good. That You can use that formula. It'll work fine. We just have, in this case, notice that we don't have a y2 or an x2. The idea here is this formula is called point slope because you're going to take a point and you're going to take a slope and plug them in. That first y and that first x, you leave alone. You're not going to mess with them. You're going to rearrange stuff to get this into the slope intercept form. So you'd be able to plug any pair of a point and a slope into this guy and it'll spit out an equation.
So we have a couple of examples for this, not too much. The first one is kind of the get your feet wet problem. It's the only one I gave, I outright gave the slope. So the first one, we have M is negative four and it passes through the point negative one, negative six. Okay. Let's get to work on this guy. Now, again, we do have that formula. Y minus Y1 is equal to M X minus X1. Because again, if I divided this guy over to here, it would be the form, uh, formula for slope, right? So that's where it comes from. Okay, well, there's our M, there's our X1, and there's our Y1, all right? So we're just gonna plug these pieces in. We're gonna have Y minus that Y1, it's negative six, and that's equal to M, which is our negative four. Start the parentheses. That X stays an X minus our X1, which in this case is a negative one. Now, I know I normally put a little plus in between to say, yay, they add uh, that changes to adding. But in this case, I'm adding them to variables. So it's not really going to clean up a whole lot. So what I generally would do would be clean this guy up a little bit. So fix your signs. And now our goal is to get this into y equals mx plus b form. Okay. Well, how am I going to do that? Just math it until it fits, right? We're going to take that negative four and distribute it in. Because there's nothing I could do with this six right now. I can't subtract it over here. I just have a minus six. It's not going to help me. So I'm going to leave that six here for now. But over here, that negative four times X, negative four X, negative four times one, minus four. And then I could subtract this six. I would have Y is equal to negative four X minus 10. There's our formula. We could even graph that with the slope and the Y intercept. And we can eyeball that, right? We would be down at negative 10, and then it would go down four and over one, down four and over one. Well, it would be really, really steep, and it would start really far down. So we're not even going to deal with that, right? We got our equation. That's our answer. Okay. I don't expect people to have understood that with just the one. So we're going to do more. Then do more. Okay. So the next one, we're going to find an equation of a line that passes through two different points. We have the point negative two, four, and we have the point one, two. Okay. Well, to use that formula, we need a slope and a point, right? So I have two points. Well, with two points, I can find a slope, right? So I can do M is, I'm just going to write down the formula again so you guys can see it. So it's the difference in the Y's over the difference in the X's. So let's say we're gonna find that with this one. What we can do is do this one minus that one over this one minus that one. And see, this is an example of where I would do that because I know I can add these guys, right? Okay, so two minus four is a negative two. 
And then one plus two is three. Okay, well, there's our slope. So now we have a slope and two points. Now we can use y minus y1 is equal to m x minus x1. Now we can use that. But you might say, Ben, which point do I use? The nice thing is that it doesn't matter. You can pick literally any point along the line and you will end up with the same formula. I could plug in this one as my x and y. I could plug in this one as my x and y. It will work out exactly the same. Now, that's not to say that I won't want to pick one over the other. Right away, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing, hey, if that one's a negative and I'm subtracting numbers, I might want to avoid that just in case I lose a sign. Another thing is that this one has larger numbers. This one has smaller numbers. So if I know I'm going to end up distributing or multiplying or adding, I might want to keep my numbers small. So I would say that the clear choice of plugging things in for this one is that guy. Now, that's not to say you can't use that. That's not to say that if you're in the test and you're scrambling and you don't know which one to use, can I use either one? Absolutely. It doesn't matter. But sometimes you have a reason for picking one over another. So let's go ahead and plug things in. We have our x and y. We have our slope. So we have y minus our y1, which is 2, is equal to m, which is negative 2 thirds, x minus x1, which is a 1. Ah, see, then that's good re a good reason to go with the smaller numbers, because I'm going to have to distribute this fraction through and I really like multiplying something by one, right? Now, the downside is we're gonna have to add two to it, but you know, these things happen. So we distribute that through. We end up with negative two thirds X. Negative times a negative is a positive. Two thirds times one is two thirds. Now, in order to solve for Y, I need to add the two to both sides. Ah, but they're not like terms. I can't add a fraction and an integer right away. I need to get a common denominator. And yes, I'm totally doing this work off to the side rather than making another step because honestly, we got too many steps already, right? So we have y equals negative two thirds x plus two thirds plus this two being added over is going to end up giving us a six thirds. So we have to get our, our like terms together. We have y is equal to negative two thirds x plus eight thirds. Aren't you glad we're not graphing that? I wouldn't want to graph that. I wouldn't mind typing it into that other you know website that I did earlier because that's no effort, but yeah. Don't want to draw that, but that's our formula. Hopefully that's making sense, guys. Do another, just like this guy. And do number three. So we have to find the line between the points five, zero, and zero, negative eight. Now this one's gonna go gray because we have zeros. Now, when it comes to which one am I going to use in the equation? Gonna be using that guy because, well, one, we have a zero on either one. So that's gonna make our workload a lot less. But again, this one has a negative, so I'm just gonna avoid it as much as I can, right? So again, we need to find the slope between the two points. The slope is the difference in the y's, so this minus that over this minus that. Okay, so we have a negative eight over a negative five. 
the negatives cancel, we just have eight fifths, no problem, right? Then we're going to take that M and we're gonna plug it into the formula that we're using for this section. That guy. Y minus Y1 is equal to M X minus X1. So we're gonna use this point and that slope. So we're gonna have Y minus nothing is equal to M, eight fifths, X minus five. So Y minus nothing is just Y. That guy's nice. Distributing this through, eight fifth times X is eight fifths X. Eight fifths times a negative five, well, Positive times a negative is a negative. And notice that the five would multiply onto the top. Well, there's a five down here, right? So it actually just cancel. This would turn into an eight. Now, if you're worried about that, you can always put that over a one and multiply across. You'd get 40 over five, which would break down to an eight. So if you can't see that, you just do it the old fashioned way. Multiply them together and clean it up. Either way, that's all we need. We have our formula. A little quicker than the last one, right? Because the last one got kind of messy. Now let's do one more of these. And I will say for those of you who joined after six this is going to be a shorter class if you missed my explanation it's because we uh we have a grand total of three subjects to cover in this particular class the rest of them will be covered in the next fall class that is happening uh, a week after the end of class so we're just we're just gonna do what we can and call it good right so the last one is saying, what line connects these points? Okay. Phrasing is a little different, but the idea is the same. We still want the slope between these points and we want to want to pick one, right? Plug it in and get our equation. So let's find our slope. It's going to be a difference in y's, negative one minus three over difference in x's, six minus seven. We end up with a negative four over a negative one. Oh, that's great, that's just four, right? That's just four. So then we're gonna use that formula again. I'm gonna write it again. Y minus Y1 is equal to M times X minus X1. I'm writing it again and I'm saying it again. So hopefully it sticks in your head just a little bit. Now we can pick either point. Doesn't much matter. Doesn't matter at all. In fact, I'm just going to go with this first one. We're going to use that one. We have Y minus the Y value three is equal to M, which is a four x minus the x value, which is a seven. Okay, so that four of course distributes through, we end up with four x minus 28. And then we can add the three over. And we have y is equal to four x minus 25. Not bad at all, right? So how do we feel about these? We concerned, we not concerned. Do you guys wanna see me do this one in particular using the other method? That's an option. 
The other method just being plugging it into y equals mx plus b. Not much of a difference. Well, let's move on. Like I said, I'm going to skip the measurement stuff for tonight and pick that up next week. So we're just going to have these next couple of slides. Four more problems left, and we are good. It's been an easy day. So inequalities on a coordinate plane. So inequalities we've done, right? We end up having ranges of numbers on a number line. but if you have an inequality that deals with more than one variable, suddenly you have a line. So suddenly you don't just have a number line, you have an X and a Y, right? So with linear inequalities, you start them up exactly the same way we do the equations, right? Uh, we start off by just graphing the line. Uh, treat the symbol as if we had an equal sign there at first. You'll find points along the line as usual. Then you either draw a dotted line or a solid line. Now the dotted line is for if it doesn't include that line. Now remember doesn't include gives us the idea that it's either a greater than or a less than. If it does include it, then that's greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. So those are the ones with the bars beneath them. So if you have a bar beneath your symbol, solid line. You don't, dotted line. And as it says down there, a solid line implies that the points along the line are also included in, in your uh, solution. Um, if you have a dotted line, that implies that it is not. So with linear inequalities, the line is actually dividing the plane between one side where all of the points would satisfy the inequality. So everything on one side of the inequality or on one side of that line is correct. And the other side of that line, none of them are correct. So what you end up doing is you shade the entire side of the line that we get the word correct on, right? So there's actually an easy method of dealing with that. Um, what I always tell people to do is in order to find out which, you pick a point at random. It doesn't matter where it is. I recommend things close to the origin so you have tiny numbers you're plugging in. Uh, you pick a point at random and plug it into the original equation. And then it boils down to, did you get something out of that that is telling you something true, or is it telling you something that's false? If it tells you something that's true, that means that the side of the line you picked that point from is true. If it's telling you it's false, then the side of the line you picked that point from is false. So you shade the other side at that point. Now, it might sound uh, more than a little squirrely at the moment, but it'll make a little bit more sense when we start working them out, okay? Now, the nice thing is that, at least for these first two, I set them up peachy, right? So for this first one, we have y is less than two thirds x plus one. Let me switch over to the document camera here. So we have that. Now, the first thing I'm noticing is that we have a less than symbol. The less than symbol means that we're going to have a dotted line. So we know that. Everything else, we'll just kind of figure out, right? Now, again, we're just going to graph this as if it was any other line, okay? Um, so what we're going to do, start with our y-intercept. 
And then we're going to move in accordance to our slope. So our slope is two thirds. So our rise is two, our run is three. Could do another rise two, run three. You could even go backwards if you want to, down to back three. Doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that we are going to treat this as an inequality. So since it's less than, we're going to use a dotted line. Well, okay, but we learned that we're going to have to shade one of these lines. So which, or what one of these sides. So which of these sides are we going to shade? I don't know. Yeah, we're going to find it. So what you want to do is you want to pick a point that's on either side of the line. Don't, don't try to get really close to it and say, yeah, that one's probably not on the line. That one's probably, nah, nah, let's. Let's make sure it's at least a little bit of a distance from our line so we don't screw up. You cannot pick anything along the line. You have to pick one side or the other. So what I like to do is if it didn't go through the origin, you better believe I love plugging in zero, zero. That is so, so little effort involved in that. Or I'll pick something else with a zero on it along one of these axes. A lot of times that's what I'll do. Um, sometimes I'll pick like one, one, um, two, one, something, something with small numbers that I don't mind plugging into an equation, right? So we're going to take zero, zero, and we're going to plug it in. So I'm going to plug in zero, zero. So we have zero for Y is less than two thirds, zero plus one. So we get zero is less than one. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. Zero is absolutely less than one. So if that means that this point satisfies this inequality, any other point I pick on this side of the line is going to satisfy the inequality. It's always going to spit out a true statement every time. So at that point, you're good to just shade this side. You ever try to shade something with a pen? Kind of awkward. But you're going to shade that side of the line. Okay. Now, if this had resulted in a false statement, that would have meant this entire side was wrong. So we would have shaded the other side. If you're worried about that, you can always pick a point on the other side and check it first. You just don't have to in that case. Okay, the next one is going to be Y is greater than or equal to negative one fourth X plus three. Now, one thing you might notice is that we have, if we have this set up nicely, this less than can sometimes be seen as below. I believe this greater than is going to end up shading above. I could be wrong. It's not like a clear cut rule, but you might be, uh, might be able to notice a pattern here. So let's see what happens. So in this case, we're going to have a solid line because this is telling us that points along the line itself are included. If points along the line itself are included, that means that every point along the line is going to make this true. So again, let's graph it. Start from our y-intercept, which is three. 
and then play with our slope. Our slope is negative one fourth. So again, I like to see that negative as being on top. So I'm gonna look at this as being a negative one over a four. So my rise will be negative one and my run will be four. So I'll go down one and over four. Down one and over four. All right. We have our solid line, but again, we need to figure out which side we're gonna shape, right? So we're gonna pick a point on either side of the line, something easy, something nice. Let's say I picked, uh, let's say I picked one, one. It's not always gonna work out perfectly that we can always use the zero, zero. I could right here, but I'm not going to. Just so you guys see what happens when you have to pick something else, okay? So, I really didn't need any of that. So we're going to pick one, one. So sometimes I will even label that that's where my, my point is. I'll have one is greater than or equal to negative one fourth times one plus three. So I have one being greater than or equal to negative one fourth plus three. Now, the nice thing is that we're not doing this particular work to get a concrete answer for every point along this area, right? So I'm looking at this and I'm like, yeah, I could go to the trouble of adding the fraction to that number, but I can see it's going to be a little bit less than three, right? And is one going to be a bigger number than anything a little bit less than three? No, right? That would still be the larger side. So this whole thing would be a false statement. Now, if that's false, well, that means that you're gonna shade in the other direction. The arrow thing might come in handy for you someday, but not today. Usually you do the arrow thing if you are doing multiple inequalities on the same graph and you're trying to find the solution that satisfies both of them. And that would basically look like, uh, that would look like if I had both of these formulas on the same graph, I would have something like that first guy coming along like this, and I would have just done arrows downwards. And then I would have this guy coming along like here, where it's nice and solid, but its lines were going upwards. And you would look at this and say, well, what's covered by both? If this is this one covers everything here, and this one covers everything here, the only place that's shaded for both is in between. And that's literally all you would use the arrows for is being, yeah, it's going to shade over there, but I'm not going to do that right now because I'm not done. Now, that's not going to be something you do for, for a while, but that's the idea. And it's really not much harder than any of these. It literally is as hard as doing two of them in one problem. That's that's it. Okay. Trying to get a good angle on the document camera here. So let's do number three. So we have x plus two y is greater than four. plus two y is greater than four. Okay, well, I like, to, I like to graph these with slope intercept. If you leave it like this, you could totally do plotting points. That's fine. If you're worried about what to deal with on the, the inequality, 
But for now, I'm just going to solve it for y. I said the word. Uh, I said y, so I wrote y. There we go. Subtracting x on both sides, I have two y is greater than negative x plus four. I'm going to divide. Whoa, my brain's turning to goo. I'm sorry. Ben is very tired. Um, we're going to divide everything by two. We're going to have y is greater than, remember this one I can view as a negative one half x. I can pull that x outside. Plus four divided by two is two. So I could take that guy. Man, we've done a lot of problems where the slope is negative one half. In fact, negative one half x plus two. Isn't that uh, negative one half x plus two? There it is. Except it's going to be dotted, and we're going to shade start, uh, part of it. But that's what our graph looks like. Cool effort means we have something to check off of, right? I'm gonna kind of circle that just so it's kind of its own area on the notes. Okay, so let's start at two. I'm gonna go down one over two and down one over two. And we have a dotted line. So we just do this. We pick a point on either side of the line, like say zero, zero, and plug it into our equation. You could do either one, our original or our cleaned up version. In this case, since I'm plugging in zeros and all my variables are over here, I'm going to do that. I'm going to just go back to the original. Zero plus two times zero is greater than four. Well, that's not right, right? Zero is greater than four? No. False. So if it's false right here, then it's true on the other side. So we shade the other side. this making sense you guys getting it you guys horrified you guys have your computer open and not paying attention okay one more we have negative x minus 3y is less than or equal to 12. So that is definitely going to be a solid line because we have the less than or equal sign, right? Anytime you have this bar underneath, we're going to have a solid line. All right. So again, I like to do the slope and intercept. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to rewrite it down here so that my steps can all be kind of nice and neat in a row. I'm going to work towards getting this y alone. So we're going to add the x over. We have negative 3y less than or equal to x plus 12. And you have a option of dividing off the negative 3 now. Divide by negative 3, divide by negative 3, divide by negative 3. So we have y alone. But do we have a less than or equal to? No, not anymore. Because we divided by a negative. And remember, with inequalities, anytime you divide or multiply both sides by a negative number, you have to change the direction of the sign. That's because what once was negative is now positive, and was once was positive is now negative. You have flipped them around. So I'm going to view this as negative one third x. And then 12 divided by a negative three is going to be a minus four. 
Okay, so we're starting down here at negative four and we're gonna go further down. No problem, right? One, two, three, four, there we go. That's where we're starting. We're gonna go down one and over three. So down one, over three. Down one, over three. And we have a solid line. And we can pick up any point we want on either side of the line. It doesn't have to be below it. All the ones we've done so far have been below, but you can use, you can still use anything up here, like our zero, zero. You can still use that. And you would have zero is greater than or equal to negative one third X minus four. Oops, not X, that's a zero. So that would be zero is greater than or equal to negative four. Well, that's true, right? Zero is above the negatives. So if that's true, then the whole side is true. So we shade that whole side. What do you guys think? Doable? Not so doable? Weird? Anybody have opinions? So, as I've said, I would like to leave the units of measurement stuff for the next class. I actually, yeah, I think we got enough material for a full class length next time. So we're going to have a lot of it, and I'd rather do it all at once rather than spacing it out by five days. So we're going to call it good for tonight. Um, you guys get a little bit of extra free time tonight. Hug your loved ones. Ignore them. Watch TV. Other than that, I'm calling it quits, guys. That's the calculator going away. I hope everybody has a good night.